Okay, folks, I'm live. You on Pal Talk? Grace Girl is going to give you the link to my YouTube page so you can subscribe and hit the like button. And if you want to see my handsome face, then you go to the YouTube page. So, folks, I'm doing two things. Again, I want you to pray that the Lord Jesus richly bless my dear brother from my heart, child of God. As you see, the last sessions I've been doing in this room, this is his home. He and his lovely wife and his family have been gracious to open up their homes for me to come and serve you by doing live streams because their internet connection is excellent. And I need you to keep praying for me in Jesus' name to get settled here in this new state, to be planted for the foreseeable for future that God will provide the provisions I need to take care of myself and my daughters, my angels, and to do mighty things for the Lord here because God is opening doors here locally for me to preach to people. I've been going to people's homes and preaching the gospel. Pray I can find a place where I can do local Bible studies as I'm doing live streams for YouTube and writing articles for my website. Now, I'm going to begin in prayer in a minute, but some of you were listening to Christian Prince barbecuing Muhammad Hijab and Ali Dawa. He put a niqab on hijab. Did you guys hear that? And as I'm talking to you, I'm also... I'm streaming this in Child of God's Pal Talk room. So right now I'm looking to his screen. I see people in his Pal Talk room, and they're here. They're praying for me, and they want to hear the Spirit speak through the servants of Jesus Christ, and I pray I'm one of them, and that Christ will be glorified in and through me and all of us, right? But did you see how Christian Prince put a niqab on hijab? <laughs> oh, by the way, I found out today is called Giving Tuesday. Only in America, you can come up with all these weird days. You had Black Friday, right, and Shiny Saturday, Cyber Monday. I'm kidding. There was no Shiny Saturday, right? Stunning Sunday. And today they call it Giving Tuesday. So I found out that Giving Tuesday is, a, is the day where Christian ministries ask brothers and sisters in Christ to give a one-time gift. That's what I just found out because I got emails from ministries saying, hey, it's Giving Tuesday. Only in America, folks. Do we come up with such weird traditions? Like we have Valentine's Day and Sweetest Day and Daughter's Day, right? And yet we don't have Big Ball Beautiful Day. I'm kind of feeling hurt. When are you going to have Big Ball Beautiful Day? But since it's Giving Tuesday, <laughs> again, one thing I want to say before I even mention it. One thing I want to say. All of us that were in, are in the ministry that were connected, David Wood. I'm going to mention people I know personally. David Wood, Christian Prince, Osama Dakdok, El Fadi from Sierra International, Jay Smith, Vocab Malone, Adam Coleman, <clears throat> John, <clears throat> what do you mean, right? Myself. We are not in ministry for money. We're not in ministry to get rich and live comfortably. God knows our hearts. That's not why we're doing ministry, right? We're in ministry because we feel called by the Spirit to serve the Lord full time. Because some people are called, I mean, all of us are called to live for Jesus 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every second, every minute of the hour by the power of the Holy Spirit. But not everyone's called to full time ministry. So you serve Jesus full time. You love Jesus full time. You honor him full time in every sphere of your life. But some people are also called to work jobs to hold positions right and so you glorify jesus christ and honor jesus christ in what you do in your labor right but god has specifically set apart some people just to devote themselves to ministry to preaching to teaching to evangelizing missionizing right and in 1999 Prior to the rise of the greatest hater and white dictator in apologetics, Hater Wood. Have you noticed, by the way, every time I start Hater Wood, Act 17 Apologetics, David Wood, he comes in, does a hit and run, chimes in, attacks, and leaves. He doesn't even listen to the session. You would think at least he'd sit and learn. Learn from Big Ball Beautiful because all his material that he used to take off and become uh, mega bucks, boku bucks, he stole from me. That's what the white man does. The white man steals, right, the resources of others and then thinks that he is the boss on earth 
and then tries to subjugate all nine non-white people, right? Because it's in their white blood. They are dictators. He started hater aid. Okay. Yeah, but anyway, for those of you in Paltuck, if you don't know why I'm doing this, it's because David Wood has decided to join my live stream for the first five minutes to do a hit and run, take shots at me and disappear because he thinks he's God's gift to apologetics. But coming back to the issue, coming back to the issue, I can say it even with, with this white dictator in my presence, David Wood, Vocab Malone, Adam Coleman, John, what do you mean? John McRae, Christian Prince, <clears throat> Usama Dakdok, El Fadi, Jay Smith, Hatun Tash, DCCI ministers, myself, we are not in ministry to become rich or to make money. Believe me, if we wanted to become rich and make money, we'd find something else to do. I can vouch for these people because I know them. I've worked with them. I can vouch they do it because they feel compelled. That's what the Spirit has called them to do. And they do it out of love for Jesus because they want to see Muslims get saved, Christians be strengthened, and Christ be glorified. And it's the honest to God truth. I can bear witness. And I, and I say sincerely, I'm not in it for money either. And I pray I'm not deceiving myself that God is purifying my heart. And I felt called to full-time ministry in 1999 where I asked the Lord, I go, Lord, if you want me to go into full-time ministry, trusting in your provision, here's a sign. And he gave me the sign. So I've been in full-time ministry since 1999. And I haven't regretted. Now, when I say I haven't regretted, the Lord has never left me begging for bread. Praise his holy name. He hasn't left my daughters begging for bread. Praise his holy name. And David can testify. He hasn't abandoned his family either. Praise his holy name. He has provided our daily needs and given us the grace <clears throat> to endure. But I will tell you, it hasn't been easy. It's been painful. It's been painful emotionally. It's been painful psychologically. It's been painful spiritually and physically. I don't know of anyone who is doing ministry from a sincere heart, especially against Islam, that's not suffering in some way. If it's not physical illness, it's an attack psychologically, emotionally, spiritually. They're suffering in some way. All right? So just to let you know, I can vouch for these brothers and sisters. They're not doing it for money. And I pray that I never, never do it for money. And I never prostitute myself for money. May the Lord Jesus save me from my flesh and my lust and fear of finances. Right? So I can, I can bear witness for their sincerity. So that's why it's funny. Today is Giving Tuesday. I got an email from a couple of ministries saying, hey, it's Giving Tuesday. So we had Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Giving Tuesday. So keep praying for us. And if the Lord puts in your heart, you want to bless the ministry. Amen. And I, it's, like I said, we're not in it for the money. We trust the Lord to provide our needs through his people because that's how he works. So Remember, it's Giving Tuesday. So give to Big Ball Beautiful, not to Hater Wood. Okay? But praise God for what Christian Prince did to Muhammad, Muhammad Hijab. He put a niqab on him. Listen, guys. Stop calling him Mimi Hijab because you're insulting women named Mimi. I know a lot of Mimis in the world. They'd be offended if you called Muhammad Hijab Mimi Hijab. If you want to call him... <clears throat> Aisha Hijab or Muhammad Hijab who wore a niqab after facing Christian Prince, then okay, feel free. All right? And then guys, I'm kind of a little jealous and envious. Christian Prince had over 3,000 people watching his live stream. David Wood, when he does his boring live streams, he gets about 1,000. I'm only getting around 200. Where's the love, folks? Can I get some love? Where's the love? That you're human of. But anyway, everyone in? Everyone in the saddle? Can we begin? Hold on, let me see something. I just want to see if this brother's okay. Hold on, guys. I can't play this right now. Or can I? No, I don't think I can play this. I don't want you to hear. Anyway, pray for our dear brother, Big Al. Pray for him. Can, can we take a moment to pray for him? Because there was an accident at work. Car accident. Let's pray that no one was hurt and that the Lord Jesus will deliver him from that situation because this is his bread and butter, right? Okay. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. 
Please, Father, for the glory of your Son, the Lord Jesus, take over this session by the power of your Holy Spirit. Fill me and everyone listening and everyone who will listen by your Holy Spirit, with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with knowledge, wisdom, understanding from your Spirit, and give us the power of your Holy Spirit, not just to know the Word, but to apply it perfectly as an expression of our deep love for your Son, the Lord Jesus, to be doers of your Word, Father. And that's where I fail, Lord. And I need your grace and mercy, Father. Save us from our own flesh. Save us from Satan's influence and the influence of the world and from false brethren who desire to destroy our testimony. Save us, Father, for your glory because we need you. We depend on you, Father. And we love you because you love us. It's because of your love that you've drawn us by your spirit to fall in love with you, to fall in love with the Lord Jesus. And we love your son. We adore your son, your heart. That became flesh and we love your holy spirit in need of your spirit in love with your spirit seal us by your spirit and father loosen my tongue to speak clearly without error without stammering or confusion help me to recall the passages and purify my motives father not to do it for the praise of men and save me from being unnecessarily offensive so I don't cause anyone to stumble and purify the motives of everyone here that they're here sincerely to learn from your spirit as you guide this conversation for the glory of Jesus. And Father, right now we ask that you intervene for our brother Big Al. Watch over him. Cover him and his household by the blood of Jesus. And deliver him from all, from all his calamities. Del deliver us, Father. Spirit, loosen my tongue. Deliver us from our calamities. And give me divine favor here. And bless my children. Cover them by the blood of Jesus. And keep us together forever. We love you and we need you, Father. We love you and we need you, Lord Jesus. And we love you and we need you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. God the Father, Son, and Spirit. All right. Worst thing you can do when you're speaking is drink coffee because it dries up your mouth and then it gives you coffee stained teeth. Now, I'm not the best looking guy in apologetics, but I'm much, much better looking than David Wood. So I have to do everything to enhance my big, bald, beautiful self so I look attractive, right? So that I don't become a stumbling block. But it really doesn't help me when I'm drinking coffee and my teeth are stained from the coffee. So I got coffee taints, uh, coffee stained teeth. Right? All right. But anyway, these past days, and I probably it's because of the coffee, my, my lisp is becoming worse and worse. Glory to God, I've lost a lot of weight. Pray I keep it off, star, and I lose more because I still need... 50, but I'm doing it very slowly. And I know I will get my health back if the Lord wants me to stay around, because I'll be honest with you. Let me very be very honest, right? <clears throat> the more calamities I see in this world, the more tribulations I see in this world, the more heartache I see in this world, the more I ache to leave this world to be with Jesus. And I say this honestly. So my prayer is always this, Lord Jesus, I pray that when my time has come, prepare me for my death and give me the grace to face it. Because apart from you, I'm a coward. And let me die covered by the blood of Jesus. Right? You, you with me there? One of the reasons why I want to stick around is to be in my daughter's lives, to see them grow up to be godly women. But to be honest, as you know, and I try to be a, an open book and as open as possible, I have not seen them. I have not held them or kissed them since June. And I don't know if I will see them sooner or later, or the Lord is going to allow this in my life. Because Jesus did say something. Let me share something with you guys. Jesus did say something. John 16, 33. He goes, in this world, you will have trials. See, he promised. Jesus doesn't lie. He doesn't tickle ears. He doesn't lie. He doesn't tickle ears. That's why he's so beautiful. He's honest with us because he is the truth in the flesh and he cannot lie. And he says, in this world, you will have tribulation, but do not be afraid. I have overcome the world. So Jesus didn't lie to us. He said, you will suffer. You'll go through trials, but I've overcome the world. So I will give you the grace and I will see you by the spirit that no trial will consume you or destroy you because you're in my hand. And I'm the all-powerful son of God. Right? So I have to be honest because I consider many of you my family. Those who are regulars, you know who you are. Billy Mandalay, right? Bill Thompson, Protestant believer, first and last, wonder, a warrior wo woman, 
Hafsai, all of you. There's too many of you. I can't mention all of you. We'll be here all day. It is a lonely world for me without my children. And I'm not trying to get into a sob story or self-pity, but I'm trying to be honest. I've never been, I used, let's put it this way. Before my kids, I struggled with loneliness. But when I had my kids, they filled my heart with joy. It was just an honor to be their father. But now that I don't have them, it's a lonely place without my children. It really is. And I know they're thinking of me and they're wondering, where's their Baba? They do not know how much I love them. I would die for them. There's only one being I love more than them. And I pray I mean this from my heart, my God. Jesus, I love more than my daughters because it's Jesus who gave me my daughters. And so I trust Jesus who loves them with a love that's beyond understanding. He will keep them whole and heal them like he did me. Because I was around six and a half years old when my mother and father split. Now, let me share with you a true story of how real Jesus has been in my life. Okay. Let me share a true story because I want to encourage you guys. I want to encourage every one of you. There was a nine-year-old boy, an Assyrian from Lebanon, whose mother taught him the gospel of Jesus Christ. Guys, pay attention to this. You want to see how amazing Jesus is? That nine-year-old boy came to me and preached to me about Jesus Christ. He was nine. I was six and a half. A nine-year-old boy came to me and told me, Jesus Christ is the Son of God who loved you so much to die for you. And then he told me, go home tonight, ask Jesus into your life. And at the age of six, six and a half, I asked Jesus into my life. Now, shortly thereafter, my father and mother split up. And I'm going to tell you a true story. The Lord knows I'm not lying here. I went in the alley. We were living in an apartment. I went in the alley. I was, I was sitting by the garage of the alley to, to our apartment. Started crying. It was around 9, 9, 9, 9.30, close to 10, around that time, I remember. Again, I'm going by memory. And I looked to heaven, and I was crying, and I said, Jesus, please send someone to talk to me. I'm not asking to see you, but send someone to talk to me. Even before I finished the prayer, to my right, at the end of the alley, a person turned the corner. Folks, pay attention to this. You want to see how real Jesus is, how close he is to us? that he watches over us and makes sure he brings us to himself and that no power will ever separate us from him. How can I not forget this story, Jason? All right. So he turned the corner, came, he was wearing black wavy, like curly hair, even a black mustache from what I remember. And he was whistling full of joy. And he saw me sitting in the alley and he says to me, Kid, what are you doing here at, uh, in the alley at night? Are you homeless? I said, no. He goes, are you hungry? I said, no. So then he comes and sits to my left. I even remember. So that's right here to my left. Now, remember, I asked Jesus, send me someone to talk to me. Now, it would be coincidence if he said, hey, it's okay. You know, you'll make it. You know, this will pass, right? I said, my, my father left my mom. And then he looked at me. Do I want to look at you guys? He looked at me, and I promise you, this is where the words that came out of his mouth. Jesus loves you, and he will never leave you. It's the last time I saw that person. That's the last time I saw that person. You see what came out of his mouth? Jesus loves you, and he will never leave you. <clears throat> Woo! Moves me in my heart. <clears throat> Moves me in my heart. So Jesus has been with me, and he has shown himself real in every step of my life, which is why right now, as lonely as I feel at times, as sad as I get at times, and by the way, last week was very hard for me. Very hard because it was a lonely week for me. Really hard because it was Thanksgiving. I didn't have my daughters. Through it all, I know Jesus is with me because he's proven himself faithful. He's been with me. That was Jesus from heaven <clears throat> speaking to that young six and a half year old boy, telling him, son, you're mine and I'm going nowhere. I will never leave nor forsake you. 
you <clears throat> belong to me. <clears throat> and I know that same Jesus loves my daughters, my nine-year-old and seven-year-old, with that same love, and he will not abandon them. Though they may feel that their Bob has abandoned them, Jesus will not abandon them. So, folks, we're not just preaching a story or talking about a fictional character. We're talking about a being that's more real than you can imagine, a being that created you and loves you and is in love with you and adores you, and I am proof. Okay? So when you come here, you're coming here to learn about a being that's more real than you can imagine, who created you, who is in love with you and wants you to know him and be in love with him. Have, never doubt that. Never doubt that Jesus is alive and he's in love with you. He's in love with me. He's in love with my daughters. And may he keep us in love with him. Right? Amen, Michelle Dengler. May the Lord bless you. With that said, let's begin. Uh, are you guys ready? You guys ready? By the way, I have a book recommendation. Those of you in Pal Talk won't be able to see it. You're going to have to come on my YouTube channel to see it. I'm going to put this book up. You see it here? It says, let me see. Let me see one second. Why You Should Believe in the Trinity. This is an older book. came out in the 90s, I believe. It's an answer to Joe's Witnesses by Robert M. Bowman Jr. Again, I want to thank you guys for your prayers and your support financially, honestly. It's because of your support by the grace of God that we're able to get these resources. This is one of the best books written by one of the top evangelical scholars, Robert M. Bowman Jr. He's one of the top evangelical scholars and scholars on the deity of Christ. He wrote this book to refute the Jehovah Witness brochure, Should You Believe in the Trinity? Find this book on Amazon. Find this book on Amazon. Get a copy of this book. Phenomenal. The man is brilliant. Right? Okay, now that said, I do want to discuss where we left off yesterday. And as you notice, the, tit the titles are catchy. Ahmad Didad and Zakarnaik, Islamic terror. I'm being silly. I'm just putting the names of these Muslim Dalagandas to attract more people, right? Hopefully they'll listen, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, they'll get convicted, they'll get saved, right? Right? So now, with that said, let's continue where we left off yesterday, discussing John chapter 10. For those of you who were with me last night, or I should say yesterday in the afternoon, it was at night, I discussed the importance of not just hearing your crowd or your guy speak, but also if you're called to evangelism, and by the way, we're all called to evangelism. We're all called to do apologetics. It's not a choice. It's a command for every member of the body of Christ. Now, let me explain what I mean. Every member of the body of Christ is called to evangelize and do apologetics. Some are called to do that full time. Not everyone will be able to do that full time, but you're going to do it nonetheless. You're going to do it at work. You're going to do it at school. You're going to do it at home. You're going to do it in your neighborhood, right? But some are called uh, to do it full time, like David Wood, myself. But even if you're not called to full time ministry, you're still called to witness and evangelize in your neighborhoods, at work, at school, you name it. You got to be ready to preach the gospel and answer objections, right? So you got to be ready when the Joe's Witnesses come knocking on your door. You got to be ready when Mormons come riding their bicycles. You got to be ready. So with that said, it is vitally important, vitally important that you guys not only hear the Christian evidences for your beliefs, but the counter responses by anti-Trinitarians or anti-Christians. In other words, it's not enough to hear a session by a Trinitarian giving you passages that prove the Trinity. You need to also see how the anti-Trinitarians are responding to our quote-unquote proof text so that you're ready for their counter responses, their rebuttals, so that you can then decimate their objections leaving them no excuse for their unbelief, right? You with me there before I move on? And that's what we looked at yesterday. We saw yesterday 
that quoting John 8, 58 is not sufficient to a trained anti-Trinitarian like a Joe Witness who's doing his homework or her homework to respond to your evidences for the deity of Christ. John 10, 30 is not sufficient. You need to know their response and then counter their response, decimating their objection, taking them captive, leaving them no excuse for not submitting to King Jesus and worshiping the triune God. So I already explained how to do that with John 8, 58 yesterday. I explained how to do that with John 10, 30 yesterday. Now, God willing, today we're going to finish John 10, 30, and then we're going to explain the Son of Man. Because someone asked me about the Son of Man. All right? How do we address their response to our use of Daniel 7, 13 and 14 to prove the deity of Christ? So are you guys okay with this, with me going into these topics a little more depth? Because my goal is to talk about core Christian doctrines, not just Trinity, deity of Christ, also sanctification, salvation, justification, worship, evangelism. I want to cover all bases by the grace of God. And one of, the, one of my favorite things to do, and I do it locally, by the way. One of my favorite things to do is just open up to Q&A and answer any question that arises, trusting the Spirit to give me the wisdom to answer it adequately and correctly from Scripture. That's what I've been doing for the past week. God has kept me occupied. There's a godly family that's been inviting me to their homes for the past week. Thanksgiving, and today I'm going to be there tonight, and they have some excellent questions. Yesterday we went into some in-depth questions like marriage and divorce and suicide and, and, and the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and issues that just came up, and the Holy Spirit just showing up in an amazing way, filling me with such wisdom to glorify Christ because that's my trust. My hope and trust is in the Holy Spirit to guide me and protect me from error so that I don't mislead the flock of Christ, right? So are we ready? John 10, 27, 30, we looked at, and we looked at 31, 33. Now, here is the counter response to our use of John 10, 30. Many anti-Trinitarians will quote John chapter 10, verses 34 to 36 to show that Jesus wasn't claiming to be God Almighty, he was claiming to be simply a son of God and one of the gods like the other gods and sons of God. So pray for me that the Spirit will guide me to help you understand what Jesus meant here and what he did not mean. So are we ready to unpack John 10 verses 34 to 36? The printer is printing, so you're going to hear noise on the side. I rebuke you. That's right. Stop, man. All right. Yep, PayPal. If you guys want to make a one-time donation real quick, PayPal is the way to go. But anyway, okay. Rizas, Qureshi, Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, Numbers 21, 6 to 9, Daniel 7 to 9, Great Pal. Okay. All right. John 10, 34, 36. Will this stop? Will you stop now? Of all the times, you now act up? See, I'm telling you, even technology, appliances, can be manipulated by evil spirits. Look. Now? Yeah, you better shut up. All right. John 10, 34, 36. Let's read. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? Here we go. I said you are God's. One step, all right? I'm a madman, dude. If he called them God's unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him, do you say of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest? Because I, because I said I am the son of God? Okay. Do you understand what's going on here? Okay, good. You understand what's going on here? You see what Jesus did? Why did Jesus quote Psalm 82, verse 6? Psalm 82, verse 6 in John 10, 34, 36. Why did he quote Psalm 82, verse 6, where the psalmist says, I say you are God's? Why did he quote that? Can anyone tell me what the context is? If you're with me yesterday, you should remember. If you're with me yesterday, you should remember. If you didn't listen to yesterday's session, you're going to miss out. Why did he quote it? I didn't say what the psalm is referring to. Judges, that's what you're saying, fine. Why did he quote Psalm 82.6? See, that's not answering the why question. You're telling me who is it about. I'm asking why did he cite it? Come on, folks. This tells me whether you go back and re-listen or study the arguments to understand them so they can be second nature, so you can apply them by the power of the Spirit for the glory of Christ. So you guys forgot already. 
right? Why did he quote John in John 10, 34, 36, Psalm 82, verse 6? There's a context. Remember what I said yesterday? You don't take a snippet. You read the statements in their intended context to get their fuller, deeper meaning by the grace of God's spirit. Love light. I don't know how many times I have to say it. I'm going to repeat it again. Super chat takes 30% of the proceeds. I'm a greedy animal. I don't want to give Google 30% of your money. It's your money that you're given for ministry for the people of God. Why should they take 30%? I've said this again. I'm going to say it again. Don't ask me about Super Chat. I know David Wood doesn't mind. Christian Prince don't mind. I mind. Why would they take such a hefty chunk from the money of the people of God that you want to give to ministries and the people of God? Okay, 30%, that's a joke. I can understand even 10%. That's tolerable. But 30%, Google needs your 30%. All right. That's why I don't do it. Okay, now let's come back to the issue. Focus. Let's focus now for the glory of Christ. Focus. Okay. Jesus responds, is it not written in your law, I say you are God's? He's quoting Psalm 82 verse 6 in response to the conversation that he's engaged with the unbelieving Jews. So you can't simply understand Jesus' point if you don't understand the context. Let's revisit the context. Before Protestant post any passages, you need sir? I know I'm listening. Okay. Before Protestant post any passages, let me remind you of the discussion of the context that we went in depth on in yesterday's session. Jesus had just gotten done telling them that believers are his sheep. Write down John 10, 27 to 33. I don't want to revisit it, so don't post anything yet, Protestant. If you go back to yesterday's session, I went in-depth on the context, but I'm going to quickly sum it up. John 10, 27 to 33, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, right? <clears throat> and I give them everlasting life. They shall never perish. No one can pluck them out of my, my, of my hand. My Father, who's given them to me, is greater than all. No one can pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So this is the context. Believers are Jesus' sheep in his hand, under his care, under his protective power. And he guarantees their everlasting preservation. There is no power in creation that will ever sever a believer from the power of Christ in preserving them. And they're not only under Christ's protective care, they're also under the Father's protective care. And in that sense, he and the Father are one in their power and ability to preserve all believers incorruptible forever. That's the context, right? With me there? That's the context. Because of that statement, the Jews got upset, picked up stones to stone him. Then Jesus says, this is now John 10, 31 to 33. Jesus says in 32, many good works I've shown you from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? Now we're going to pick it up. We're going to read 33 to 36. Their response, and then Jesus' answer. John 10, 33 to 36. If you don't understand the context, you won't get why Jesus quotes Psalm 82, verse 6. The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, <clears throat> but for blasphemy, and because that thou, you, being a man, makest thyself God. We're not stoning you for a good work, but you're a mere man, a flesh and blood Jew, and you have the audacity to blaspheme because you make yourself up to be God by claiming the things that the Hebrew Bible says are true of Jehovah God alone. Go to yesterday's session. Listen to my in-depth discussion. You'll see they were correct. They were right in that he did claim to be God. He was a man, but they were wrong in assuming that he blasphemed because he's not a man who wants to be God. He is God Almighty who became man, a flesh and blood Jew. Right? Even though he's not the father. But you got to listen to yesterday's session for the end of exegesis. So then Jesus responds. Here's his response. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. Why do you say that? In response to what they said. We want to stone you for blasphemy. Because you're a man. You make yourself out to be God. And Jesus says, wait. 
You want to stone me because you think I'm blaspheming? Well, is it not written in your law? I say you are gods. Two things to note here. Number one, notice Jesus uses the term law, which in Hebrew would be Torah, to include books other than the Pentateuch. He's quoting Psalm 82, verse 6, and he calls Psalm 82, verse 6, law. Notice that the term law in the New Testament is not limited to the first five books of the Old Testament. Many people, when they refer to the term law, they have the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses in mind. Yet here, Jesus uses the term law more <clears throat> broadly. He uses the term law in reference to Psalm. So in one sense, the term law can be limited to the books of Moses, because the Jews call that the Torah, which means instruction. But in another sense, that term, law, Torah, can be used in a broader sense to encompass the entire Old Testament canon. You with me there? Folks, what do you do with someone named Chauvin Gomes? I'm in the midst of a conversation talking about John 10. Chauvin Gomes has no interest in learning about the context and asks me about Isaiah 48, 16. That's not related to the context. What do I do with such Christians that pretend to come here and learn and listen, but their mind is somewhere else? They're on tangents. Why are they here? Before I move on. Can you help me understand? Why would Siobhan Gomes quote Isaiah 40? Can anyone tell me what's the connection with Isaiah 48, 16 and John 10, my discussion? Why is this person here if that person's not interested in learning the topic I'm discussing so he or she can better understand the Bible and handle it more responsibly? Repent. Right? You get my point? I don't understand the logic of Christians, honestly. Now, coming back to the issue. That's the first point. Second point, notice that Jesus responds to their assertion of blasphemy by quoting the Hebrew Bible, referring to others as gods. Why would Jesus do that? Nir Tamit, you know, when you tell me to be patient, you know you got to go, right? Send Nir Tamit out of my channel, please. I don't know how many times I have to tell people, brother, you don't last long in my channel by not conducting yourself in a manner that won't egg me on and cause me to stumble and sin and then offend other brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Now, folks, don't lie to me and say that you love me when you know repeatedly that I say, don't chime in, don't pontificate, don't tell me what to do, don't change the subject, don't attack me. But when you do that, that means you want me to stumble. So then I cause others to stumble and then I get a reputation of being a jerk like David would. Let me repeat it again. This type of preaching is not going to be for everyone. I won't be offended if you go somewhere else. Honestly, I won't. God has raised up a variety of teachers to draw various groups. No one teacher can draw everyone. And God deliberately has raised up imperfect human vessels so that no one man will be the focus and attention of Christian devotion. My style will not appeal to everyone. I am not offended. Go find someone that's more suitable. Don't come here and challenge me, pontificate, distract. You won't last here. I, I don't know how much more plainer I can make it. Okay. Now, let's focus in Jesus' name by the power of the Holy Spirit. No more satanic distractions. Let's focus for the glory of Christ. Why would Jesus quote a psalm that refers to others as gods to respond to their assertion, their allegation that he's blaspheming. This is what I want you to focus. Don't let Satan distract us in Jesus' name. May he protect me too from being distracted. Why is Jesus quoting a psalm that speaks of others as gods in answer to their allegation that he's blaspheming for claiming to be God? Thank you, King of Kings. And the Lord will lead others to other teachers. I like Nada. Nada, you can see she's a sharp cookie. She basically got the point. Even though the church fathers use Psalm 82.6 for the doctrine of theosis, 
in its historical context, it's not talking about believers, but she got the point. Nada got the point. Let me read what she just said. Bless her heart, our sister in the Lord. Christ is effectively saying, if those who have received this honor by grace are not guilty for calling themselves gods, how can he, who has this by nature, deserve to be rebuked? Beautifully said. Wonderfully said. She answered it. She answered it. Did you get? Did you guys get her answer? Wonderful. Blesses my heart. I get happy when I see brothers and sisters in Christ who are being illuminated by the Spirit to understand the Word and then live it out for the glory of Christ. If you read the context of the psalm, the context of the psalm is about wicked rulers, evil rulers, unjust rulers who are corrupting the earth, spreading evil, and oppressing the righteous and the marginalized. And what Jesus is saying is, if even these rulers can be called gods and sons of the Most High, though they are wicked and evil, and God is going to destroy them for their wickedness, how dare you accuse me of blasphemy when I am truly the Son of God, and the works I do prove I'm one with Him in essence? Go ahead, Demario. With me there? Thank you. I'll thank you for first, right? You understand it? So Nana, God bless her heart, she got it. You understand Jesus' point? Let me, let me explain what Jesus' point is. He's saying, wait, 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 wait. You hypocrites, you know the law. Psalm 82, 6 calls wicked, evil rulers who spread corruption and evil and mischief in the world, who corrupt justice, who oppress the righteous, the poor, the marginalized. As wicked as they are, they're still called gods and the sons of the Most High, even though God is going to kill them dead and destroy them for their wickedness. And yet you would not dare accuse the psalmist of blasphemy because you know this is the Word of God, and the Word of God cannot be broken, meaning the Word of God cannot be accused of blasphemy, of error, and the Word of God has its fulfillment and yet you have no objection that this psalmist who calls them gods <clears throat> have no problem with him calling these evil beings gods. You don't accuse him of, of blasphemy because you know he's writing the words of God. And the words of God cannot be falsified, cannot err, right? Because it's the word of God. It's completely reliable, completely accurate, infallible. And you dare accuse me of blaspheming when I am truly God's son? And the works I do prove I am one with them in essence. If such evil beings can be called gods and they're evil and corrupt and do things contrary to God and you have no problem with them being called gods and you don't accuse the psalmist of blasphemy, how dare you accuse me of blasphemy when I am truly the son of God and the works I do prove it. You see his point? Do you see his point? I'm going to go into the psalm itself and unpack it. But before I do that, I want you to understand what Jesus' point is. You see, Jesus being God in the flesh, being God in the flesh, being perfect wisdom, infinite wisdom, knows how to silence his accusers with the right words and the right passages. You see it? Who would have thought to quote Psalm 82, 6, only Jesus? So wait, these beings are evil, corrupt rulers whom God is going to destroy. And they're still called gods. And they do things that anger God, things that God would never do. And you dared accuse me of blasphemy because I said I'm the son of God, which I truly am. And the works I do prove I am one with him. Making sense before I go to the rest of the chapter? You see... The impeccable wisdom and logic in Jesus' words, if you understand context. Sent encouraging words to hell to be encouraged in the flames of fire. Yeah. Samaritan priest. Okay, you with me there? Okay, now. 
let's now go to Psalm 82 and unpack it. Now let me unpack Psalm 82, okay? We're going to go through the entire psalm, and I'm not going to get into the debate whether this psalm is referring to angelic beings as gods or human judges. There is a debate among Christians. There are certain Christians who say Psalm 82 is about corrupt Israelite human judges. Then there are others made quite popular by Michael Heiser. There are others who hold the view that this is talking about the heavenly council, the council of angelic beings who are called gods, but they're evil and corrupt and wicked, and God is going to destroy them. Whatever interpretation you take, it still doesn't matter to the point I'm about to make. Are you with me here? If you believe there are spirit beings who are called gods or human beings called gods, the point is still the same. They are evil. They are corrupt. They are unjust. And God is going to destroy them. So if such beings can be called gods without the psalmist blaspheming, how dare you accuse me of blasphemy when I am truly one with God the Father, does everything that the Father does in the same way that he does it, and the works I do prove that I am one with him. Right? So I'm not getting into whether it's referring to angelic beings or human rulers. I don't care what interpretation, what interpretation you take. Let's go to Psalm 82. It's eight verses, but we're going to read it verse by verse. Please make sure you're understanding the point. I'm not confusing you. And someone was criticizing me that I repeat myself more than once and telling me, well, they can go back and rewind the discussion. You don't need to repeat it. And I told that guy, take a hike, get lost. I blocked him. Let me repeat again. Don't be stupid enough to come to my channel and tell me how to teach and how to run my channel. The reason why I repeat myself at least twice, three times or more, is because not everyone is on the same level. And I happen to speak fast, so I'll repeat the same point over again because I know we are designed to learn by repetition by the grace of God's Spirit. You don't like it? Get lost. Right? Now, let's read Psalm 82, verse 1. You know I'm not going to win any popularity contest. Let's read, folks. Please pay attention. Read. Thank our brother Protestant for helping me to help you. A psalm of Asaph, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Thank this brother for helping me to help you, but my brother was going to quick. He quoted all eight verses, even though I'm going to make him do it again. Poor guy. Post Psalm 82, verse 1. One more time. Psalm 82, verse 1. I have to unpack. Well, let me give you the link, too. Let me give you the link. Hold on. You can see this for yourself with the inner. Thank God for modern, modern technology. Psalms 82, verse 1. There you go. Okay. Here's the link, folks. Click on it. You're going to see it says Elohim. God standeth Elohim. The word there is Elohim. In the congregation of the mighty. The word mighty there. Is actually Il, the name of God. And he judges amongst the gods. Judges amongst the God, amongst the gods. Elohim. Literally, the Hebrew says Elohim stands in the congregation of Il to judge the Elohim. Did you hear what I just said? Click on the link. Okay, click on the link. It's Elohim stands in the congregation of Il. E-L, the name for God, like Emmanuel, Israel, Ishmael, El. Elohim, here's this being called Elohim, and he stands in the congregation that belongs to El to judge the Elohim. You want me there? We were over 200, we're down now, so they lose people more and more. Okay, but love light. This is what it would say if you looked at it. It says, Elohim stands in the congregation. Here, I'm going to spell it out for you. Congregation of El, right, to judge the Elohim. Okay?
Okay, everyone there? So you have three words in Hebrew for God. Elohim is used twice. I should say two words. Let me correct myself. Lord Jesus, protect me from error. You have three groups identified by the Hebrew terms for God. Three groups. You have the Elohim who stands, the Eel that the congregation belongs to, and the Elohim who are judged. So it's two words for God in Hebrew, but used for three different groups, right? And Elohim that judges, the Eel to whom the congregation belongs, and the Elohim who are judged. You with me there? Are you getting this before I move on? I want to make sure you're getting it. So the translation is, God stands in the congregation of God to judge the gods. God stands in the congregation of God to judge the gods. Elohim stands in the congregation of Il, singular. This is the Hebrew word for God. It's in the singular. Elohim is plural. God stands in the congregation of Il, of God, to judge the gods. Okay. You see why I got to go slow with Psalm 82 so you understand the meat of it and how Jesus masterfully used it to silence his critics? You getting it so far? Like I said, I may not be entertaining all the time. I am trying to be educational, trusting the Spirit to continue to illuminate me, to illuminate you for the glory of Christ. Okay. So Elohim, God, stands in the congregation that belongs to Il, singular form for God in Hebrew, to judge the Elohim, the gods. So why is this God judging these gods? Why is this God judging these gods? Okay. Let's read. Let's read. Now we're going to read verses 2 to 5. Verses 2 to 5. How long will he judge unjustly? See now, he's talking to those gods. You gods, how long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Help the wicked to prosper. All right? Selah. And now it's telling the gods, you should be defending the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. Now notice what it says about the gods. They know not. Neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. You see why God is going to destroy these gods? You are accepting wicked people. You're helping wicked people to prosper. You don't care for the poor and the fatherless. You don't maintain justice for the afflicted and needy. You are spreading corruption in the earth. You're corrupting the world, destroying its foundation because the foundation of the world is righteousness and you're helping the wicked to prosper like this wicked, evil judge in Chicago, this daughter saying, may the Lord Jesus crush her right, for his glory. With me there? You see why God is going to judge these gods? Do you see why God's going to be judging these gods? Selah is a musical refrain. Guys, why do you get into issues that are relevant to the point? Why do you get sidetracked by something like Selah? So, can you focus on the meat? Or do you want to stay on milk? Right? And why are you making it a big deal out of lowercase and capital case? Oh, my God. Yeah, I'm streaming on YouTube, Zero Calorie. Okay. Can we talk about more irrelevant issues? Oh, it's lowercase g, brother. See the difference? In Hebrew, there is no lowercase g or capital G. Why are you guys making a big deal out of an English translation of Hebrew words? Selah is often used in the poetical sections of the scriptures because it serves as a musical refrain. Even though Selah is also a, a place name. 
Riaz decided to chime in and say, look, look, brother. Riaz Grisham, my love, but not too much. Look, brother, it's lowercase g, brother. It's lowercase g. And then Andrew Owens said, oh, lowercase g, gods, demons? Mm -hmm. What does the lowercase got to do with anything? In Hebrew, the case is the same. Why are you making a big deal out of English? <laughs> Uh, we were sailing along on a moonlight bay. Right? Okay. Okay. Riaz, are you going to keep bringing irrelevant issues like you typically do, my brother? Lowercase g, friends. Look, look what I discovered. It's lowercase g. God, say, you say. <laughs> For the rest of you who are not going to go on tangents. Yeah, on tangents. Exactly, Angela Squirrel. You understand why God is going to judge these gods? Yeah, now you're parroting Michael Heiser. You sound like a good Heiserite, Sila Lumen. Right? That is Heiser's line. So you memorized Heiser well, but you can't memorize anything I say. So you now you really hurt my feelings. But now, for the rest of you, let's focus. Let's focus. Do you see why God is going to judge these gods? Do you see why God is going to judge these gods? Do you see what God's complaint against these gods happen to be? You, you take the side of the wicked person. You spread corruption in the earth. You destroy the foundations of the earth. You don't bring justice to the needy. You don't care for the poor and the fatherless. Right, you oppress them and let them be oppressed, but you let the wicked prosper. So, you see why God is going to judge these gods, right? Did we get that part? Are we there thus far? Did we get that part? It shouldn't take too long for me to unpack this if we don't get distracted. If we can get people to focus, you see, when I start cleaning house, we drop to 184. Okay, now let's read now six and seven. Six is what Jesus quoted in part. He didn't quote it fully. Six and seven. Let's read six and seven. Yeah, I see you, Serene, and Pell talk too, and I see you here. So you better be careful, Serene. I'm, I'm gunning for you, Serene09. I have said, this is what Jesus quoted. He quoted it in part. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. You see what he said? Though I said you are gods and sons of the Most High, you're going to die like, and the word in Hebrew is actually Adam. You're going to die like Adam did. You're going to die like Adam. Here, let me give you the Hebrew here. Okay, here you go. So the word Adam can refer to the first man, or it can be what we call a collective singular in that it's referring to mankind in general. I believe in the context it's referring to the first man, Adam. Here it goes. Nevertheless, you shall die like Adam. Right? Why do I believe it's a reference to Adam? You see it says, Ke Adam. Ke Adam. Why do I believe it's a reference to Adam? Because if you go back to Genesis account of creation, Adam was created in the image of God and was given dominion over creation to rule on God's behalf. To rule on God's behalf as God's image and representative. Right? You with me there? So in a sense, Adam was a God, so to speak. Because he bore the image of God, and he was given dominion by God to rule the world, but he too died because of sin, because of corruption. How are you doing, Alan Rule? You see it? So these beings also, like Adam, are rulers. These beings also, like Adam, are called gods. And these beings also, like Adam, corrupted themselves because of sin and rebellion. And like Adam, they will die. With me there? 
Everyone getting it so far? And princes, let me see. I believe the Hebrew word is sarim. Yeah, ha sarim. Yep, princes, right? They're rulers. So notice what they have in common with the first man. They are gods in the sense that they stand in the place of God, representing God and ruling on God's behalf. That's what it means to be in the image of God. Part of the meaning of being an image of God is that we reflect God. We image God's qualities his moral <clears throat> characteristics, and rule on his behalf as his visible representatives, right? So these beings are like Adam in that, like Adam, they are gods in that they are image bearers of God called to represent God in their rule over the earth. But like Adam, they sinned and rebelled and corrupted themselves, and like Adam, they died. Before I move on, is everyone getting it or not? Everyone getting it or not? Before I move on. So I'll make sure. I'm going slow here. If there's someone confused, ask me to clarify. So in the Hebrew, it says, Ke Adam, like Adam, which can mean like men. Or, I believe, more accurately, like Adam himself. See, you are like Adam. Adam, too, was a god of sorts. In the sense that being in my image, after my likeness, he was to represent me. The, the visible representation of God on the earth as he images God's moral, moral correct characteristics, right? Reflects God's moral characteristics in his rule over creation on God's behalf. But like Adam... They blew it because Adam sinned and rebelled and died. So are you seeing the connection between these rulers and Adam? And I'm going to repeat myself more than once, and you wonder why, because I want to make sure it sinks in. But that's why I do it. I want you to get it, to use it for the glory of Christ. So they are like Adam in that they are image bearers of God. So in a sense, they are God's in that they stand in the place of God, representing God, ruling God's creation on God's behalf. But like Adam, they sin and corrupt in themselves, and like Adam, they die. Everyone on Paltok got it, or am I putting you guys to sleep? I already did. I already repeated about five times already. So if you're getting it, now let's read verse 8. Psalm 82, verse 8. Psalm 82, verse 8. Arise, O God. Arise, O Elohim. That's the same God who's going to judge them. Arise, O God. Judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Did you catch it? The God who's going to judge the gods and destroy them will then take possession of the earth. Did you catch it? The God who's going to destroy these wicked gods will take possession of the earth because the nations are his inheritance, right? The nations are his inheritance. So the God who judges the gods is the God who judges the earth and who possesses the nations as his inheritance. Is everyone getting it? The God, the Elohim, who's going to destroy these Elohim, these gods, is the God who judges the earth and inherits the nations. He's the heir, right? According to the Bible, who is the God that judges the earth and who is the God who is the heir of creation? Let's go to John 5, 22. John 5, 22. Let's unpack it. John 5, 22. Don't think, Razo. Feel. John 5, 22. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Right there. It's not the Father who arises to judge the earth. The Son does all judging. That's the first clue in identifying who that God is that judges the gods. 
Remember, the God who judges the gods judges the earth and the nations are his inheritance. Jesus is the one who executes all judgment, not the Father. And Jesus is the heir of the Father. He is the heir to creation. Mark 12, 6 and 7. Jesus' own words. Mark 12, 6 and 7. You guys following it with me or no? Man, CP gets 3,000. I'm down 174. What's up, bro? I'm losing people. That's how popular I am. Jesus speaking, the parable of the tenants. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. So the beloved son is the heir. Jesus is saying, I am the owner's beloved son and the heir, and I do all the judging. Hebrews 1, verse 2. Hebrews 1, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Heir of all things. So Jesus is the judge of the earth, the heir of all things. The inheritance of the nations is his. With me so far? Are you getting it? Before I move on? John 3.35. John 3.35. Watch how I'm going to make a case that's going to be solid. Send airframe on his merry way. Get him out of here. John 3.35 so he doesn't come back here again. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. You got it? All things are under the control of Jesus, under his sovereign authority, right? John 13, verse 3. John 13, verse 3. Ignore these demons, these trolls. Focus, folks. John 13, verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, everything is under the sovereign authority, controlled possession of Jesus the Son. Right? John 13, 3. John 16, verse 15. What does our Lord say? John 16, verse 15. Jesus speaking, all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father has are mine. Whatever he owns belongs to me. I'm the heir. I own what he owns. Clear? God bless you, Nana. John 17, verse 10. John 17, verse 10. Watch here. And all mine are thine. Speaking to the Father. All that are mine are yours, and all thine are mine. And I am glorified in them. Whatever you own is mine. Whatever I own is yours, Father. What you own, I own. What I own, you own. Everything you own is under my control. You catching it? Is it sinking in? See how many verses I'm giving you? Luke 10, verse 22. Luke 10, verse 22. Luke 10, verse 22. All things are delivered to me of my Father. See, everything has been handed to me, given to me. Everything. Everything. And no man knoweth the, who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he who and he to whom the Son will reveal him. Right? How many passages do I need to quote from Jesus 
from his disciples, from the inspired scriptures to show Jesus is the heir of all creation. All the nations are his inheritance. All that the father owns belongs to him. And he's the one who does all judging. The father judges no one. Right? I mean, I can't give you more, but is it clear? Do I need to prove the case? Or if it's clear, you understand now what you just learned in regards to Psalm 82 and its interpretation in light of the New Testament revelation. The Elohim who stands in the congregation of Eel to judge the Elohim is the Elohim who judges the earth and who possesses all the nations as his inheritance. In other words, this is what Psalm 82 verse 1 is saying. Jesus Christ is the God who stands in the congregation of his father to judge the other gods and destroy them for being wicked and claiming the earth as his rightful inheritance. That's the interpretation of Psalm 82 in light of the New Testament. That's why Psalm 82 verse 1 speaks of three groups using two different Hebrew words to identify them as God. There is the Elohim who judges the other Elohim. And this Elohim stands in the congregation of Eel. So let me paraphrase Psalm 82 for, verse 1 for all of you. Let me paraphrase it. The Son of God stands in the congregation of his Father to judge the wicked rulers who are wrongly viewed as gods. That's the interpretation. You with me there? Do you see now why Psalm 82 says Elohim stands in the congregation of Il, singular for God, Okay. Hold on, let me just do this. Okay, watch here. Il to judge the Elohim. Because this is what Psalm 82 verse 1 is saying in light of the New Testament revelation. The Son stands in the congregation of the Father to judge the wicked rulers. That's what you're that's what Psalm 82 is saying. You catching it now? Before I move on. That's why you have three groups referred to by the Hebrew words for God, Elohim and Il. Because you have the Elohim who judges the Elohim and the congregation of Il, because the Elohim who judges is the one who inherits the nations. That's Jesus Christ. And the eel to whom the congregation belongs is his father. Clear? Who's not getting it? Who's not getting it? You see how many, or I should say, you see the depth of Psalm 82? How many nuggets lay in Psalm 82? And how it's pointing back to Jesus and why Jesus would use Psalm 82. I just want to make sure you're getting it. That's why I'm pausing. So now you see why Jesus in his infinite wisdom and his brilliance cited Psalm 82. You want to make sure that you're getting it. It's a psalm of Asaph. Asaph is the one who composed it, Abdul Halaj. Don't worry about that. You want to make sure you're getting it. So you know what Jesus is basically saying? Look, if wicked rulers whom I'm going to destroy in judgment can be called gods, how dare you accuse me of blasphemy when I am truly the Son of God, one with Him, and can do whatever the Father does, and the miracles I do bear witness to that truth. Right? And implicit in his use of Psalm 82 is the fact that he's basically indicating he is the God 
that judges those gods. And he's basically indicting those Jews as being no better than those wicked rulers. And just like judgment came upon them, judgment will fall upon them as well. You see what, what he's doing here? You see on how many levels Jesus is operating on? All of this in his response showing, look, wicked rulers can be called gods. That's not blasphemy. So don't you dare falsely accuse me of blasphemy when I am truly the son of God and can do whatever God does and the miracles prove I'm unlike them. I am what they're not. They are wicked rulers who can be called gods because they stand in the place of God. But I am truly God, one with the Father, unlike them. And the miracles prove that. And then secondly, you are like those wicked rulers. And just like I came in judgment against them, I'm now coming in judgment against you. All of that in what Jesus is saying, and they don't get it. But you're supposed to get it. Do you know why you're supposed to get it? Because John... The narrator, the evangelist who wrote this gospel, Inspiration of the Spirit, has prepared you nine chapters previously to get the point in chapter 10. Chapter 10 is not the first chapter. He's already prepared you for this. If you read chapter 1 carefully all the way to 9, he's prepared you for this. Do you know that? You want proof that he's prepared you to see Jesus in the psalm, Psalm 82, as that God who destroys these wicked gods? Do you want proof that John has already prepared you for that revelation? John 9, 39 to 41. John 9, 39 to 41. And Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that they which see not might, might see, and they which see might be made blind. Bam! He just told you, I came to judge and condemn you wicked rulers. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. Bam! He's now judging the wicked rulers of Israel. Do you see why it's important to read context? But how many of us actually read context? How many of you would have made the connection with John 10 and John 9 to see John has already prepared you to realize that Jesus is the God of Psalm 82 who rises in judgment against these wicked rulers and destroys them. Send Nicodemus on his merry way. You caught it? Now, notice what Jesus said. If you were blind, you'd have an excuse for your sin. But you are testifying against yourself that you see. So that means you're claiming you do understand my words. Therefore, your judgment is even worse because your words will be used against you. So you see, right? So that means you have no excuse for not recognizing who I am because you claim not to be blind. Therefore, you're going to be damned even worse. He uses their words against them. Thank you, life is good. Let me repeat what life is good is saying. I need to study the Bible, not simply read it. Amen. The Bible is not given simply to be read. It's been given for it to be understood, unpacked, and lived out by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus. And it's not a hidden message, sort of the truth. It's right there before our eyes. John didn't hide anything. He wrote it by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Send advocate for free speech to the dogs so he can bark with them and fight for the rights of the dogs to free speech. Thank you. Torah doesn't simply mean, Fred, I'm teaching live. I'll call you later. Agamini. Shio, 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 shio. 
All right. Sorry about that. There was some little Chinese lady saying xiao shi shi shi. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, Fred. Go shave your head. Okay, anyway, you got it? Everyone with me? Fine. Are you learning too? Everyone with me so far? Who would have thought there would be this much meat in Jesus' use of Psalm 82? And if you want further proof that John is preparing you to see Jesus as the God of Psalm 82 who comes in judgment against the gods, you want further proof? You want further proof besides John 9, 39, 41? Okay. How does John begin his gospel? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, right? And John 1, 10 says, he was in the world, and though the world came into being through him, was created by him, the world did not recognize him, right? John 1, 9 to 10. Let's look at that. John 1, 9 to 10. Let's look at that. Put 9 and 10. John 1, 9 to 10. John chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. Okay. No, it doesn't distinguish the God from humans, PM. You're not listening to me. Because you're not, you're going to have to leave, brother. Why are you being an ignoramus and not listening? I just told you in verse 7 it says, like Adam, ke Adam. And that it's more likely reference to the first man, Adam, not to men in general. Why aren't you listening and trying to impose your interpretation, which you learned from Heiser on me? Do you want to get blocked too? John 1, 9 to 10. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So that he came into the world, right? He was in the world. The word of God was in the world. And the world was made by him, and the world knew him not, right? You caught it? Jesus is the word who is the light of all creation, who illuminates all men to escape their darkness, who came into the world. And John 1.14 says, that word became flesh. Now let's see if you make the connection. Let's see how many of you are paying attention and meditating to understand the deep meat of John, where he goes out of his way to identify Jesus as God in the flesh. Let's see. John 10, 34, 36. Let's see how many of you caught it. John 10, 34, 36. Let's see how many of you will catch it. Caught it and will catch it. Let's see. John 10, 34, 36. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said, Ye are gods. If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, so he came from the Father into the world. Thou blasphemous because I said I am the Son of God. Who caught it? I don't think you caught it. The key is in verse 35. No, not I said, Angela. That He's quoting Psalm 82, 6, where the psalmist says, I say you are gods. Nope. Vine caught it. Vine caught it. He caught the connection with Jesus. John 10, 35 says, the word of God came in judgment against those gods. The word of God came in judgment against those gods. And lo and behold, there was the word of God in the flesh coming in judgment against those asking him these questions. John 10, 35, 36. One more time. If you read from John 1, you're supposed to make this connection. If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came. So the word of God came in judgment, speaking judgment against them. Well, who was standing before them? That word of God who now became flesh, judging them for their unbelief. Wow! You see what Jesus is doing? And what John is doing and wants you 
the one born of the spirit illuminated by the light of Christ to see you see what Jesus and John whom he inspired wants you to see from this discussion the same word of God that came against those gods in judgment is now standing before the Jews in the flesh and judging them for their unbelief. Before I move on. Before I move on, let it sink in. You catch it? The God who judged them in Psalm 82 is the word of God. That same word of God was now standing in the flesh before these Jews who were also wicked rulers for their unbelief. I'm not saying anything because I want you to let simmer on this. Simmer on this meat. Let it sink in. Amen. He's telling them basically, or John wants you to see, that same word of God has come again to judge a different group of wicked rulers. The word of God judged those wicked rulers back then, but he's back at it again, judging another group of wicked rulers for their unbelief and corruption. Billy Mandalay. You catch it or no? You see what you guys are missing when you don't read context. John 10 is not the start of the gospel. John 10 is nine chapters later after the chapter one, where in the prologue, he's already told you who Jesus is. He is that word of God, who is God, who creates all things, who gives illumination, who came into the world, who became flesh, who's the judge. He's already told you all this so that when you get to John 10, he wants you to make the connection, connect the dots. Before I move on. Right? Is it is everyone with me so far? Yeah. It's all right. If anyone's confused, say, hey, I'm a little confused. I'm a little confused. But if everyone's getting it, do you see how amazing the Bible is, how amazing John is, how amazing our Lord Jesus is? And that being God in the flesh, he possesses perfect, infinite wisdom, and he knows what passages to quote at the appropriate time. Right? Just want to make sure you're getting it. Okay. Okay. So what do we learn from Jesus' use of Psalm 82? Was Jesus quoting Psalm 82 to show that he is like these gods, no, no more, no less? He's no different than them, no better than them. Is that what he was doing? Is that what he was doing? Or was he saying, look, you hypocrites, you stinking hypocrites. Let me put my charger in. How dare you? Hold on. How dare you accuse me of blasphemy when in the word of God, which cannot be broken, cannot be falsified, evil rulers, corrupt rulers, wicked rulers are called gods, even though they're wicked and corrupt and God is going to kill them dead like Adam. If they can be called gods, right, how dare you accuse me of blasphemy when I am what they're not? They are called gods because they represent God, stand in the place of God, though they're wicked and evil and God will destroy them. Yet I am the son of God who is one with the father in essence and can do all that the father does. And the works I do prove I can do whatever he does and I have his approval and authorization. How dare you accuse me of blasphemy, you hypocrites, right? And then as you unpack it, you see what level he's putting himself on. 
The word of God came in judgment against these gods. The word of God came from God to judge them. And lo and behold, guess who Jesus is? He's that very word that came from the Father out of heaven into the world to save those who, who believe and judge those who won't. Right? So John 10, 34, 36 is one of the most powerful witnesses to Jesus claiming to be God Almighty, the eternal word that became flesh, one with the Father in essence, and the God of all the earth and the judge of all the rulers who will destroy wicked princes for corrupting justice. He's claiming to be the God of Psalm 82. It is Sam Shimon. You sound like Sam. Priest, it's me, Sam Shimon. I'm on my YouTube channel. Blown away? Sink it in? Making sense? So I want to park it here. Let it simmer on it. Simmer on it. Think about it. You see why now the enemy attacks us, right? You see why Satan would attack David Wood and Christian Prince and Anthony Rogers, our precious brother, would attack me to try to make us just give up, you know, try to drown us in trials and misery and depression so we stop glorifying the Lord and give up because of our trials because he hates us and hates what we're doing. By the power of the Spirit for the glory of Christ. Jesus Akbar, amen, Adam Seeker. I hope this session blessed you. Did you understand now the deep of the depth of John 10? Because I'm gonna finish up with some brownie points, but before I do that, I'm taking my time slowly because you really, folks, please, please. Help me to help you and love me for the sake of the Lord by learning the arguments that I'm presenting in these sessions, understanding them correctly, applying them appropriately for the glory of Christ. When I teach something and you go back and repeat, let's say, an error or continue presenting weak arguments, that hurts me and disheartens me because that means I'm not being effective as a teacher to take you to a higher level by the grace of God's Spirit. Right? But now, did it honestly blow your mind away how amazing Psalm 82 is in the manner in which Jesus used it because the appropriate interpretation of Psalm 82 in the context of Jesus' words, in the context of the Gospel of John, shows that Jesus is that very God of Psalm 82, who destroys these wicked rulers who are called gods, right? He is that God who comes to destroy them. He is that God who comes to judge them. He is the God who judges the earth and the nations are his inheritance. Right? Clear? Do you see why you're doing a disservice to the people you're witnessing to, to simply quote John 10.30, I and my Father are one, but ignoring John 10.27 to 39 and seeing what that meant in the context in which it was stated. Right? Billy Mandalay, Vine, everyone, sink it in. Vine, is it helping you see? You probably already knew these points. Thank Jesus, weak Christian. And you're not a weak Christian. You're strong in Christ, a warrior for his glory. Right? Okay. So now that I've explained that Jesus is not saying, I'm repeat again, Jesus is not saying, I am like those gods. And I'm a son of God like them. That's not what he was saying. Make sure you understand why he quoted it. He's quoting somebody to show you hypocrites. Here in the psalm, which is the word of God, which you know is the word of God, which is infallible, cannot be mistaken, cannot be 
falsify. If the psalmist by inspiration calls these wicked, evil rulers, gods and sons of God, whom God has destroyed, right? Who are not like God, who don't do what God does. How dare you accuse me of blasphemy when I do everything the Father does in the same way that he does it as proof that I am truly, essentially his son, one with him. If these wicked beings can be called gods, then you have no right to accuse me of blasphemy when I am truly God, the Son of God, and the miracles bear witness. Right? And then when you unpack it, he ends up being the God who judges the gods. You see how amazing it is? Of all the Psalms he quoted, he quotes the one Psalm where the New Testament identifies him as that very God who judges the gods, these rulers, and destroys them righteously. Isn't it amazing? He quotes a psalm in which he is the God of the psalm that destroys these wicked gods. Exactly, Joel Glenn Davis. I love you, Joel. Want to kiss your head? You got it. So Christ's use of Psalm 82 was to simultaneously illustrate the Pharisees' position as false accusers of blasphemy, but also to demonstrate that they are haughty, corrupt rulers. Bam, Joel, you got it. And just like the word of God came in judgment against those rulers in Psalm 82, that same word of God was now standing before them in the flesh, judging them for their wickedness. Joel, you got it, bro. Now, Joel, is it amazing or what? Now, to top it off, that even the Jews understood Jesus wasn't denying Joel. To top it off and to prove that Jesus wasn't denying that he is God, notice what he goes on to say and their reaction. John 10, 37 to 39. Just to prove that my interpretation is accurate, consistent, and the only correct interpretation of the context. Here, John 10, 37 39. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. So if I didn't do miracles to prove that the Father and I are in union, I'm one with him, they don't believe me. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand. Why in the world did they try even more so to kill him if Jesus was denying that he's one with the Father and therefore God in the flesh? You see how it ends? It ends with them even more determined to kill him. Because they knew, and Jesus never corrected them, that he did claim to be God in the flesh, though he's not the Father, by claiming to be able to do everything the Father does in the same way that he does them, and only working in union with the Father at all times. They knew this man, either he's a lunatic, God forbid he's demonized, right? But he can't be God because he's a man and he's clearly talking as if he's God. Exactly, Grace Girl. You caught it? So why would they be intent all the more to kill him if Jesus was saying, hey guys, what's wrong with you? Come no, man, I'm just like those gods, those sons of God of Psalm 82. They're not really gods, right? They were lesser divine beings, if you want to take Michael Heiser's position. Or they're human rulers who simply represent God, and that's all I am, no more, no less. Why are you getting upset? If that's all he was saying, why in the world did they become more adamant in trying to kill him? Why in the world did they become more adamant in trying to kill him. Bill Mandeley, that's exactly what he was doing. John, the apostle who wrote those words by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Bill, Billy Mandeley, you know what John wanted to see? He wanted to see Jesus' identity as the God of Psalm 82 because he is the God who arises to judge the earth. He is the God to whom the nations belong as his inheritance. He is the God who destroys these wicked rulers, these false gods. He is that God mentioned in Psalm 82.
You got it now, Billy Mandalay? And again, to prove to you he is that God who destroys those wicked gods, those evil rulers called the sons of God. One more time, and we'll go into another point, and I'll wrap it up. John 10, 35 and 36. Yes, Michelle. They clearly understood what he was saying. Yep, Tony. They understood that Jesus is basically saying their fate is in his hands. If he called them gods, pay attention, unto whom the word of God came. Ah, the word of God came to those gods just like the word of God had come to them in the flesh. Are you making the connection? See, the word of God came to them just like the word of God is now standing before you and has come to you from the Father. Unto whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken. Say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest because I said I am the Son of God. You catch what Jesus and John are doing. The word of God came to them just like the word of God has come to you in the flesh from the Father because John has started his gospel by telling you this is the word that became flesh. Because Miron, the Jews were not impressed by miracles because they were told on the basis of the Old Testament, Miron, that even false prophets can do miracles and that doesn't prove that they're sent by God. That's why Jesus and the apostles are constantly appealing to scripture to show it's not just the miracles, but that Jesus is perfectly fulfilling the prophecies in the Old Testament as proof that he is the one that was announced to come. Well, I mean, when you say the law, yes and no. You have to unpack that. Thank you, Timothy. You see the point? It's not sufficient to do miracles. Because miracles can even be performed by false prophets according to the Old and New Testaments. Do you guys want me to give you verses to prove that? So the Jews would not be swayed by signs and wonders. Why do you think the apostles go out of their way to quote Old Testament prophecies that Jesus fulfilled? Because they knew that miracles in of themselves do not prove that someone has God's authorization. What would prove the position is, if the person is in perfect conformity with the Old Testament and is perfectly fulfilling the Old Testament promises. Because notice what Deuteronomy 13 verses 1 to 5 state. Deuteronomy 13 verses 1 to 5 state. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams... And give it thee a sign, say a miracle, or a wonder. And the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken, you will not listen unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For Jehovah your God, the Lord your God, proveth you. He's testing you to know whether ye love Jehovah your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Ye shall walk after Jehovah, Yehovah, your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death, because he hath spoken to he hath spoken to turn you away from Jehovah, Yehovah, your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which Jehovah, Yehovah, thy God, commanded thee to walk in, so shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. Did you catch it? Yes, yeah, Surah Aziz, you're not following me either. I don't care if Jesus did 10 million miracles. The Old Testament says that doesn't prove anything. The message has to be consistent. It has to agree with the Old Testament, and you cannot contradict what it says. You got it? Why do you think Jesus and the apostles are constantly appealing to the Old Testament prophecies that Jesus and only Jesus fulfilled, showing with the miracles and the prophecies, you have no excuse. I'm fulfilling the prophecies and I'm doing miracles. 
You have no excuse. It's not simply miracles that I'm contradicting the Old Testament. I'm perfectly fulfilling the Old Testament and doing miracles, the greatest of which is I will rise from the dead immortal. Saran, don't, don't challenge me, brother. You're not starting off on the right foot with me. If you're telling me it's lessons, it's not simply lessons. It's the word of God that Jesus fulfills. Don't pontificate and challenge me. If you're one of those that don't believe in the Old Testament, you need to go. Don't stay here, brother. I don't tickle ears, and I'm not going to tickle your ears. The Old Testament is the foundation. You contradict it, you're a false prophet. You don't like it, take a hike, Zeron. And I say that with respect. And you can also monitor me and record that. In fact, here, let me prove to you that you must be in conformity with the Old Testament in order to show that you have God's approval. Are you ready? Even the resurrection of Christ had to have been announced in the Old Testament for it to be a valid act of God. Go to 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 for the proof. Saran, so you understand by listening more than pontificating or arguing. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 4, for the proof. Greater Israel, you are a dog. You're not a Jew. You're a son of Satan. You don't belong to Abraham. Your father's the devil. Get out of here. Okay. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Did you catch it? It's not simply he died for our sins. The scripture said he would die for our sins. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You catch it? Why are the apostles repeatedly pointing to prophecies of the Old Testament that only Jesus fulfilled because they knew and Jesus knew, who's the God who inspired the Old Testament, that he already put in the Old Testament this very fact. I don't care how many miracles someone does. That person must agree with the Old Testament, conform to its teaching, cannot contradict it, cannot go against it, must have the same view of God and salvation taught in the Old Testament in order to show the miracles are from the same God. You got it? So the Jews are not wrong for rejecting miracles because they're told in Deuteronomy 13, miracles are not enough. The person cannot teach you to follow other gods you have not known or go against the Old Testament. Why do you think Jesus, who's the God who revealed Deuteronomy 13, Jesus revealed Deuteronomy 13, if you believe he's God. He's now living up to the very standard that he gave his people to use to judge. He's living up to that standard. Hey, I'm fulfilling the Old Testament prophets. They wrote about me. It's all about me, and I'm perfectly fulfilling them. And here are miracles as further confirmation. What else do you guys want? Right? What else do you guys want? Exactly. John 5, 39, 40. John 5, 45, 47. Moses wrote about me. The scriptures testify about me. Notice the repeated appeal to the Hebrew scriptures. Look, it said this, Jesus fulfilled it. It said that, Jesus fulfilled it. Jews, you have no excuse. He perfectly fulfilled the promises and did miracles, the greatest of which is he rose immortal, never to die again. And I'll even prove it to you. Let me just make sure I got his name. Okay. Did you know? Here's the book. A late Orthodox rabbi named Dr. Pincus Lampede, an Orthodox Jew, a historian who examined the historical evidence for Jesus. Here it is. Dr. Pincus Lampede wrote a book as an historian. Resurrection of Jesus, a Jewish perspective. Do you know what he admit? He's passed away. Do you know what he admitted? 
Folks, you can even watch his debate with Walter Kaiser on the John Ankerberg show. Okay, guys, listen to this. Pincus Lampede admitted the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus is overwhelming. And he says, on historical grounds, Jesus was raised from the dead. Did you know that? He goes, as an historian, he admits the historical evidence shows that Jesus of Nazareth was raised from the dead. Yet he still did not believe Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. You know what he said? He goes, God raised Jesus as the Messiah for the Gentiles and as a test for us. Because he didn't fulfill any of the prophecies that the Messiah was supposed to fulfill. So yes, he admits the historical Jesus was raised from the dead. He is the Messiah for the Gentiles. But until he does what the Old Testament says Messiah will do, we can't follow him. Do you see my point? Do you see my point? He wrote a book providing the evidence demonstrating the resurrection as a fact of history. The tomb is empty. God raised Jesus. He wrote a book and he said, yes, God raised Jesus. That's a fact of history. But he's not our Messiah until he fulfills the promises of the Old Testament. So if he comes back again, and he fulfills them, I'll accept them. You see what principle he was operating under? What principle was he operating under? Deuteronomy 13. What do, you, what do I mean? Yeah, he has been raised from the dead. That's a fact of history. I can't deny it. But that's not good enough for me as a Jew. As a Jew, I stick to the Torah, and the Torah told me that whoever comes must conform to the teaching of the Torah. As far as I can see, Jesus didn't do what the Messiah was supposed to do, so God raised him from the dead. The Gentiles can look to him, but he's not our Messiah until he does what the prophets say Messiah will do. Pincus Lampede, right? You got the link, the book? P-I-N-C-H-A-S. Pinchas Lampide. L-A-P-I-D-E. So you understand why it's not enough that Jesus did miracles, the greatest of which is the resurrection of the dead. You have to show that Jesus is teaching about God, the nature of God, and the apostles teaching about God, the nature of God, and the fact Messiah is God in the flesh, are deeply anchored in the sound interpretation of the Hebrew Bible. That's why those Trinitarians who are not able to demonstrate the Old Testament evidence for the triunity of God or that God exists as a multi-personal being will fail in their polemic and apologetic. Do you know that? Because the smart Jew, and they've done it, Tovia Singer and others have said it, Deuteronomy 13, you Christians are teaching us a God that our ancestors did not know. How can we follow you? Abraham was not a Trinitarian, didn't know the Trinity, yet he's a friend of God. So you're teaching something that our ancestors did not know, did not believe in. We can't follow your Jesus. Right? Exactly, Alex Gaskin. You said it. James White, William Lane Craig put a weapon in the hands of the Jews to bash us with when they say the Trinity is a revelation between the Testaments. No, it's got to be anchored in the Old Testament. Otherwise, you put a weapon in their hands, and give an excuse to deny the Messiahship of Jesus. Let me give you a final example. I'm done with today's session. Acts 17, 2 to 4. Acts 17, 2 to 4. Watch here. Okay. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Pay attention. Reason with them out of the Scriptures. Notice what he did. Watch. 
opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. You see what he did? He first used the Old Testament to prove Christ had to die and be raised from the dead, and then he pointed to Jesus. And by the way, he came. Jesus died and rose again. But notice how he started. He didn't start with the resurrection. He started with prophecies. Messiah has to die. And God will raise him back to life. And lo and behold, he's here. Jesus died and was raised. And notice what verse 4 says. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude under the chief woman, not a few. Do you see what he did? Notice, folks, he didn't start with the resurrection like William Lane Craig does or others. He starts with prophecies showing them, hey, let me show you Isaiah 53. Let me show you Psalm 22. Let me show you these prophecies that even the rabbis know it's about Messiah being killed, being cut off, dying for us. And then let me show you where God will raise him from the dead. You see it's there? Yeah, Paul, we see. That's Jesus. And yet, fulfilled prophecy is a lost art among apologists. How many apologists you know, whether William Lane Craig or Mike Lacone or James White, appeal to Old Testament prophecies that Messiah would die for our sins and be raised immortal by God and exalted to heaven in order to prove that Jesus is that Messiah? Virtually none of them. The only one who does is someone like Michael Brown, who debates Jews and knows the importance of Old Testament prophecies of a dying and rising Messiah. Do you know why our evangelical scholars? Okay, here, Tony, prove me wrong. When's the last time you've heard William Lane Craig, Mike Lacona, Daniel Wallace, Rob Bowman quote prophecies in the Old Testament of a dying and rising Messiah or that Messiah would be God in the flesh. Even James White. I'm not attacking them. When? When was the last time? But notice who actually quotes Old Testament prophecies of a dying and rising Messiah. Those who deal with Jews, like Michael Brown. Coincidence? Is it a coincidence that a Jew witnessing to Jews quotes Old Testament prophecies? Why do you think Michael Brown does it? Because he's a Jew and knows the Jewish mentality. And he knows to convince a Jew that Jesus Messiah, you're going to be have to, have to be able to show from the Hebrew Bible, Messiah dies for our sins, is raised immortal, sits in throne, and then will come to establish God's kingdom on earth. Right? Understand the need for showing that Jesus and his followers are in perfect conformity with the Old Testament in their concept of God and his nature, in their teaching of the Messiah and his two natures, his vicarious death and resurrection. All of these truths have to be anchored in the Old Testament and established from the Old Testament for their message to be true. Right? You get it? Or am I putting you to sleep with this? Because I did an in-depth exegesis of John 10. Right? But you got it, right? Making sense? Sinking in? Miracles are not sufficient. Consistency, conformity with the previous scriptures. That, with the miracles, will prove your case. Why do you think we don't accept gurus, 
or anyone else today who does miracles but contradicts the gospel because we're operating under the same principle, right? If I see a Hindu guru who does something miraculous before my eyes, like levitate or manifest jewelry or food or does a miraculous healing, that still wouldn't convince me to follow him. Why? Because I understand I have to follow the New Testament and he must agree with the New Testament because he can be doing miracles by the power of Satan to deceive me. So his miracles are not good enough. So we too follow the same principle. We too are following the same understanding. Your miracles don't prove anything to me. Do you agree with the New Testament? Are you interpreting it correctly? Are you handling it reverently? Do you have the same view of Jesus' New Testament? So with the Jews. Matthew 24, 23 to 25. Almost done. I'm about to end it. Matthew 24, verses 23 to 25. The miracles must agree with the New Testament because the New Testament has already been established. Jesus' fulfillment of prophecies and his resurrection have confirmed he is the Messiah, and the New Testament is the revelation of that Messiah of Israel. But Matthew 24, 23 to 25, read with me. Matthew 24, verses 23 to 25. Then if any man, Jesus speaking, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders. Notice, they will do great signs and wonders. False prophets, lying prophets, false Christs, will do signs and wonders that are so amazing, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Their signs will be so convincing and so amazing that even the elect will have to do a double take and would be deceived if it were possible. But thank God, God preserves the elect so it won't be possible. Behold, I've told you before. Right? Clear? If it's clear, John 10, 34, 39, clear. No, I don't, Vine. I am a historical, historic pre-millennialist. I believe Christ will return to the earth and establish his rule for a thousand years on the earth, ruling over the nations who have not converted. And during that thousand years, there will be many who will die and then eventually resurrected. And so I believe that it had immediate fulfillment, but also a future fulfillment. I'm not a preterist. I'm not a partial preterist, right? Even though much of Matthew 24 is about 70 AD, not everything in the New Testament is about 70 AD. A lot of it has to do with Christ's return physically to the earth. That's my position, my understanding of eschatology. I'm not amil, I'm not postmill. Some days I'm panmill. It all pan out. Let me give you a final verse or a section of scripture. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 to 12. PJ, Sam, what are you what are you saying tomorrow? God's wailing. What? What are you talking about, PJ? God's wailing? Do you want me to block you? Do you even make sense? 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9 to 12. The man of lawlessness, the antichrist, the beast. Watch this. The man of lawlessness, the antichrist, the beast. Notice, he'll do miracles. Pay attention. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, he'll be energized, empowered by Satan with all power and and signs and lying wonders. Wonders to lie and deceive, mislead people. Wonders to lie and deceive, mislead people. Pay attention. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong illusion. God will allow Satan to delude them, deceive them by doing miracles through the Antichrist, which they will buy hook, line, and sinker. That they should believe a lie. Why? That they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Did you catch it? You see what he's saying here? You see what he's saying? The man of lawlessness will be energized, empowered, authorized by saying to do sign. He will do miracles. Miracles to deceive people, lie to people, mislead them from God. 
But who who fall for those lies? Who buy those lies? Those who have shown a reluctance to accept the truth of the gospel, who've been opposing the gospel, who've <clears throat> thrown the truth of God behind their back, refused to submit to it. So God says, those people, their punishment is, I'll hand them over to the lie. So what's the point, folks? Who told you miracles are proof that a man is speaking on God's behalf and is authorized by Christ? Who told you that? The Old Testament didn't say that. The New Testament doesn't say that. Miracles are important provided the person doing the miracles is in perfect agreement, conformity with the theology of the Old and New Testaments. Jesus is the one who gave that standard for the Jews in Deuteronomy 13, and then he came and perfectly lived up to that standard by showing, look, it's not just the miracles. All the prophets wrote about me. All that they said about me, I am fulfilling in regards to my first coming. Everything they said about my first coming, I am fulfilling. So with me fulfilling those words and then doing miracles, I've left you no excuse. You get it now? All right. I hope you're blessed today with today's session. I provided what I believe by the grace of God's spirit, a very in-depth exegesis of John 10, 34, 39. Make sure you listen to that exegesis along with yesterday where I went in-depth on John 10, 27 to 33. Study the arguments, memorize the arguments, understand the arguments, present the arguments by the power of the Holy Spirit. More people get to see the depth of scripture, the beauty of scripture, and see how real the God of the Bible is and that Jesus is alive and he loves us. Lord willing, I'll try to be on tomorrow. I'll try to be on daily if God permits. But I do need your prayers for my health, for my daughters and I, that God will keep us together, bring them to me, keep us healthy, that the Lord tarries and he wants me around. I'll see them grow up to be godly women, to provide for our needs. If the Lord wants me to continue to do ministry, to provide for the ministry. And give me favor here and save me from this corrupt, wicked, evil judicial system. Wicked judge, an agent of Satan, and give me the grace to be holy unto the Lord and be pleasing to the Lord. And I really do cherish your prayers because it's it's it gets hard, folks. Again, it's the holiday seasons, Thanksgiving passed, and I was very sad, lonely, and depressed without my angels. Christmas is around the corner, and I'm already feeling sadness and loneliness because my heart from Jesus on earth is my daughter's. They are my gifts from Jesus, and on earth they are my heart, right, from Jesus. And the more I'm away from them, the harder it gets. So it's going to be a hard holiday season because I prefer to be with them and holding them and kissing them and pray God will sustain me because it's hard, lonely, and sad, right? So as I'm speaking to you, in fact, during this entire session, I've been uh, I've been struggling with just sadness and loneliness in my heart because I really love my girls. And I pray in Jesus' name, he reveals to them how much I love them and I ache for them. So pray and God bless you guys. And Lord, when I'll see you tomorrow. And don't forget, today is Giving Tuesday. So if you want to give, do so Patreon, PayPal. Christ is risen, risen indeed. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Son of God. God Almighty in the flesh, you are the Lord of glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. By the way, we have this filthy, filthy, wicked dog, a dog of Satan. He's upset because his mother doesn't know who fathered him, Captain Jack. He's got a fascination with homosexuals because he's projecting. He's calling me what he is because he's upset that his mother gave birth to a dog like him. You filthy dog. You're not a man. You wouldn't say that in my face, you filthy coward. That's why you're hiding behind the screen, you bastard. But Jesus, have mercy on you, you pathetic dog. Christ is risen, was indeed. Amen. It's what I do to these filthy dogs. They're upset at their mother for not knowing where their father is. Love you. Christ is risen.